So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, yes, we can. People ask for the slides, so uh, I have made them available, so you don't need to take snaps or photos of these. Uh, the links are given here for uh, these set of slides and also for a related set of slides which um, deal with creating an alternative to Western education, which I delivered uh, earlier. So these are uh, closely related subjects. So this is just the title, Rethinking Social Sciences and Humanities for Pakistan. And this has been a central concern of mine for a long time. A uh, paper I wrote in 2008 was entitled Improving Social Science Education in Pakistan. And basically my concern is that we are applying conceptual frameworks developed in the West without um, thinking about the fact that these are not applicable to Pakistan. So for example, in Pakistan, Marxists are still thinking about the laborer and the capitalist, the mazdoor and the kisan, even though this is not the class struggle in Pakistan. In fact, the class struggle here is between the English speaking class, which um, inherited power after the colonizers left versus the vernacular class, which is the uh, which is the uh, the people of Pakistan. So basically, it's the colonizers versus the colonized. And this struggle never took place in the uh, West. And so the Western social theory does not deal with this. This is a heritage of colonization, which the West never experienced. And so to study the class structure and the power struggles within Pakistan, requires going outside the boundaries of Western social science. So one of the things that we need to study in uh, developing a local so 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 social science is the impact of colonial heritage. Again, something never experienced by the West. So um, the psychology of the colonized is very different from the psychology of the colonizer. And I think this is one of the key messages of Edward Said's book, Orientalism which basically says, if you want to boil it down to one sentence, is that the global co colonization by the West created a superiority complex in the West and an inferiority complex in the East. And this psychology of the colonized uh, has been studied by very many people. And basically, it's a psychological slavery. And the solution to this problem is decolonization. And... Uh, uh, this uh, damage is done by the process of education. So um, the uh, colonization ended a long time ago, but the colonization of minds continues today via the Western education, which is uh, globally uh, in use. This Western education is deeply Eurocentric. And what it teaches us basically if you want to simplify, is that West is advanced and developed, and the East is backward, primitive, underdeveloped. And so this needs to be countered uh, in the minds of the students. And I have given a few um, uh, talks on how we can counter this. And But basic, uh, but the basic is the central notion of development is not looting of wealth from um, uh, other countries by force or other people by force, but development consists of human development, how to learning how to become better beings. So <clears throat> just as an illustration of uh, the one of the one of the efforts being done globally is to give black pride, create black pride and the Black Panther is a movie which has been praised for this effect. But I would like to point out that in this effort and many other similar efforts all over the uh, colonized nations, including the Islamic world, suffer from a deep defect. So this Black Panther movie basically shows a hidden kingdom, a secret kingdom in Africa, which has a certain kind of uh, energy power and so a certain science and technology in which they are very advanced. So this is the wrong kind of effort because basically it implicitly accepts the standards of the West to judge ourselves. And the standard is 
scientific progress. In fact, uh, we don't need to play in the ball game according to the rules that they have created. We need to develop our own standards, which is basically human standards. We should emphasize kinship, family, excellence in character, uh, skills, integration with the environment, which our religion and generally uh, most cultures uh, teach and honor. Uh, whereas the colonizers only value wealth and do disregard how it is acquired. And so science and technology serve this purpose of providing power uh, in the efforts to colonize and exploit either people or environment. And this, uh, so we should not be attempting to create pride by competing them with them on those grounds. Rather, we should uh, emphasize the difference that we are, uh, we use different standards. We, we, are, we are concerned with human development, not with the accumulation of capital. So in order to be able to, the, uh, in order to be able to uh, reject social science and rebuild it, we have to look at the puzzle created by social science in the use of the deceptive term uh, science. So when we say social science, then the word science itself represents a claim to universality. But when you look at the nature of social science, this is obviously lessons derived from European historical experience. Uh, there's, it's very simple and many, many people have remarked on it. So, for example, Mitchell writes that the possibility of social science is based upon taking certain historical experience of the West as a template for a universal knowledge. So the puzzle is, why does social science, when we, when we talk social science, we should be talking about the social science, European or Eurocentric social science, because obviously social scientists have used the institutional structures of Europe to, de to develop their theories. And um, so why should it be universally applicable? It, uh, it applies to European societies probably, but certainly not to African societies or Islamic societies because we, are, we have entirely different institutions and conceptual frameworks. And so the answer to this puzzle is the, uh, is the Edward Said's book on Orientalism that all Western knowledge about the East is tainted by this conquest and colonization. And because uh, of the superiority complex created by this global conquest, uh, Western society considers itself to be the more advanced and uh, considers that all other societies are infants. And when they grow up, they will become like Europe. And so basically development means becoming like Europe. Now, this is actually uh, uh, not true. And the counter nar narratives uh, start by looking at the experience of the conquered. So uh, there are books describing the uh, American conquest of the Red Indians from the perspective of the uh, Native Americans. And similarly, uh, Dal Rimple has given an account of how the whites, uh, the Europeans who invaded um, India realized the superiority of the local culture. And similarly, in Australia and in Japan, uh, there are uh, books which describe the point of view of the defeated and the colonized. So in general, in world history, we have seen many examples where barbarians overcame advanced uh, and effete civilizations. And in general, in those historical events, the barbarians learned from the advanced civilization. Uh, but in the most recent wave of con conquest, the European barbarians overran the world, but did not learn from the more advanced civilizations. Instead, they destroyed them. Uh, now, the one of the reasons for this inferiority complex that we have acquired is uh, a book um, mentioned in a book by Jack Goody called The Theft of History, 
which basically the Europeans have written history so as to erase the contributions of other civilizations. So one of these is the, uh, the one of the ways in which it has been done is described in this other book, the Greek strategy, which is that the um, Schumpeter says that there is a 500 year gap in which nobody had any uh, economic thoughts on the planet. And the reason for this is that all of the contributions of the Muslims or the Islamic civilization in general, uh, either they were moved back to the Greeks or they were moved forward to Western copyists. So we think of Aristotle and Plato as the wisest men on the planet because <coughs> a lot of advances on those uh, philosophers by Muslim scholars uh, have been attributed back to the originals. And similarly, Copernicus basically copied from Ibn Shatir, but he is known as the revolutionary uh, person who gave us the conception of uh, a helios heliocentric system. Whereas the fact that he basically copied the book of Ibn Shatir is not known. And those who know it don't agree or acknowledge it. And the reason he did, uh, he did this, he, did, he hid these origins was because the Catholic Church was persecuting anybody who borrowed from Islamic thought. So they had to hide their sources. So this fabricated history is one of the deadliest weapons which has been used against us. And I have given some uh, more details. So <clears throat> one of the consequences of this theft of history is a direct attack on the Islamic faith because according to Islam, the greatest treasure of knowledge is the that which was given by God to man 14 centuries ago. And um, what the knowledge that God gave to man, Alam al insanam alam yalam, is obviously su more superior to anything that any human could create. But today, a Western education only uh, mentions the contributions of the West over the past three centuries. And these don't seem to have any links to the Quran and the Hadith. So it seems as if uh, Western knowledge is superior to all other knowledge. Indeed, there is no knowledge other than that which is created by the West. So this is in direct conflict with the message of the Quran. So how can we rebut this idea that one bookshelf of an Englishman contains more knowledge than all of the literature of Arabia and India. So the problem actually is subtle. Uh, the conflict is comes from the theory of knowledge, epistemology. According to the Enlightenment uh, philosophers, all knowledge comes from observations and reason. But this is not true because we are built, uh, our hearts are built to know uh, the good and the evil. And once you exclude the heart from uh, considerations of knowledge, the Quran mentions repeatedly and also the Hadith about how the heart is an uh, instrument of cognition and it is not the eyes which are blind but the hearts. So actually, although uh, the Western epistemology asserts the exact opposite of what I am going to say, all human knowledge is built on moral foundations. If we say something is worth studying, it means that this is worth uh, test, uh, spending our uh, lives on. And when we say that, then you're making a moral statement. Economics started out as a branch of moral philosophy and it remains a branch of moral philosophy, although the moral bases of modern economics have been concealed and, have, uh, and there's a pretense of objectivity, just like social science pretends to be objective and universal when it is built on a moral uh, framework uh, developed by the Europeans. So to understand this better, we need to uh, look at how religion became marginalized in the West uh, to understand their theory of knowledge. And this has been studied by many people, uh, but I will, uh, um, skip over the details. But basically, the uh, key is that in the 16th century, religion was the master interest of mankind. It governed all 
departments of life. And uh, by the 18th century, religion became marginalized and became a system of personal beliefs, uh, which, does, which did not interfere with the public domain. Uh, there are many reasons for this, uh, but it is not our, uh, uh, our task today to discuss that, although I have discussed this in a number of different places. And uh, the central reason is that there was a century of religious wars which had uh, between Protestants and Catholics, which had deep effects on European psyche and thought. And the consequences of these wars was that Europeans experienced the fact that religion is not capable, their religion is not capable of uh, uh, governing the public domain without creating battles, both uh, domestic and international. And so they rejected religion as a basis for creating a society. And this led to the necessity of rebuilding knowledge from scratch, from zero. So this involved rejecting authority and tradition. And um, the new philosophies of knowledge of empiricism and rationalism came in, that knowledge only comes from observations and reason. Heart, soul, intuition, and subjective human experience were rejected as a basis of knowledge because they had led to the misconception that religion was the right path. And since they, their experience, the European experience showed that it was not, so they rejected these sources of knowledge. So basically, once you understand how, um, uh, once you understand that there was a vacuum created by the rejection of religion uh, about how to govern public life, then you realize that social science comes from the rejection of Christianity. It is a way of uh, understanding how society should be constructed after rejecting Christianity. And so, it is based on an ontology that there is no God, judgment day, or after in life. And therefore, the universe and a life on it is meaningless. And once you reject afterlife and uh, judgment, then it's obvious that the pursuit of life is a, is the purpose of life is pursuit of pleasure, power, and profits. Society is just a jungle of competition. And human beings are animals. And the survival of the fittest is the only moral principle. And so, the key transformation which occurred from the 16th to the 18th century was that society was thought of as a community with common goals. But um, just as Thatcher said, there is no society. And just as Hobbes said, uh, basically the natural state of human beings is war of all against all in this uh, jungle of fierce competition. So this, was, this is the conception which underlies all of modern social science. And it's obvious that this conception is not matched with Islam. So these toxic moral foundations where life is basically war of all and against all, and we don't care anything about others, and certainly nothing about future generations, there's no morality, has led to the bloodiest century on the earth with continuous wars. Uh, there's the war uh, against by the corporations against the planet for profits, which has led to the extinction of millions of plants and animals the climate trans crisis which threatens uh, human existence. Um, there, this has led to individualism and hedonism, which has led to loss of family, community. And since these are the prime sources of human welfare, there has been a, a strong um, reduction of um, happiness in the uh, advanced uh, so-called uh, the richer societies with 50% of the children <clears throat> more than 50% in the West being born to single mothers, they never experienced the love and warmth of a family. And this has been a dramatic loss, but it is not measured when you count the uh, GNP per capita. So we need to develop an alternative to social science, which is based uh, on, uh, on uh, Islamic foundations, which accept God and consider success as being on the day of judgment, and therefore, they are built on generosity, social responsibility, um, cooperation, and um, striving for success on the Day of Judgment. And these are dramatically opposed to the capitalist ideas of um, greed, competition, um, individuality, and hedonism. So there has been a lot of work 
by different people. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, one of my papers on this topic is listed here, and Dr. Rajiv Shanturk has been working on decolonizing the social sciences, and he has developed a fairly deep uh, theory about this. Um, I have um, also offered a, a suggestion, a sketch of an outline of how we can rebuild social sciences by going back to Ibn Khaldun, rejecting the developments which took place on the West on the basis of Western um, universalism, the idea that everything, that the Western society is a template for universal society. Uh, so we go back to Ibn Khaldun and we can develop Ulum al-Umran on the basis of his work, he is the first uh, sociologist, in fact. And one of the key insights is that communities are created by human, uh, collective identity and the communities are the drivers of social change. And this is in contrast with methodological individualism at the heart of modern social science. Uh, so uh, one of the consequences of this is that uh, in Islamic society, we work at the community level, not at the individual level and not at the national level. Those are the, those are subsequent. Uh, as opposed to this in secular society, there is no community. So the only possibility for collective action is at the government level. And many Muslims being deceived by these conceptual frameworks have sought to implement Islam by working at the government level. And this is impossible as Wael Halak has pointed out, that the state itself is based on very highly Eurocentric conceptions. And uh, these are in conflict with Islam. And therefore, we can't use un-Islamic means to implement Islam. Uh, the basic contradiction between nation state and uh, Islam is that in nation state, the state and the state authority holds supreme authority, whereas in Islam, uh, the law of God, the Sharia, stands above all state authority and will be enforced against the majority and against the king. So uh, that's a different conception of society. And one can't create Islamic society by un-Islamic means. So I have uh, spelled out a three-dimensional framework for social change, which we need to implement, which is very different from uh, modern social science. And basically, it uh, involves looking at three different um, um, dimensions. One is the normative dimension. What is an ideal society look like, which has been spelled out in the Sharia. And then there is the positive, which describes the existing state of affairs. And then there is the transformative, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. So each of these requires separate work. One of the key... Um, uh, elements in this new theory is to give human agency a vital role. US history moves because we attempt to understand patterns of history by developing theories. And when we use develop these theories, then we our response to historical events is shaped by these theories. These theories are often wrong, but even when they are wrong, they are effective in shaping history because our actions are um, based on our understanding of history. And this understanding is mediated by theories. So human agency plays a very important role in creating history. Human beings are not robots subject to mathematical laws. Uh, and they are, and the, uh, the trajectory of uh, nations or societies is not determined by any mathematical laws and cannot be determined by regression because of the freedom that we have to think about what's happening and to change and to choose. So the study of history cannot be insulated from human agency as in science where you're studying mechanical objects which have no free will. Uh, in particular, I have uh, studied Islamic economics and I have explained how um, we have been stuck at an impasse because Islamic economists have accepted uh, as a neutral and objective description of reality modern economics, even though it is actually the neoliberal economics is a religion and not a science. And um, the modern economics is based on assuming homo economicus. And I have an uh, ongoing set of lectures in which the first lecture I said that let's uh, develop a, a, a theory of behavior on the basis of 
gratitude, contentment, and trust, shukr, qanat, and tawakkul. And these will be opposed to the uh, homo economicus behavior basis of greed and selfishness and distrust. And so we can develop our theory on dramatically different foundations. So this is the last slide. Uh, and it gives you the link to these slides themselves and uh, talk on rebuilding the social sciences and on also uh, a talk which describes how we might go about developing Ulum al-Umran, which is an Islamic alternative to 